Okay, the chapters kind of just flow into one another. And we will kind of do a little bit more with this chapter before we take a break in just a few minutes. Uh, because the, the last part of the last chapter was really just leading us to breach of contract. Right? What happens if it's something that isn't excusable? where the parties have not negotiated a print agreement, and you have breach of contract, now what? What are the remedies under uh, a no contract? So again, what is breach of contract? Contracts are private agreements, and if one or even both of the parties to a contract do not do exactly what they said they were gonna do under a contract, um, you know, and again, contract can be oral, contract can be written, it's better if it's written, because we can see the terms more clearly, we meaning the court or an arbitrator or a mediator can see it after the fact. Um, that could lead to a breach, and a breach could lead to remedies. Remedies are to correct something. But most likely, um, breach of contract leads to that. There are other things, but most things damages. So when we say that someone has to perform on a contract, whether it's to build a house or whether it's to pay somebody, uh, performance comes in three different types, okay? There is, not shockingly, complete performance, also referred to as strict performance. There is substantial performance, meaning did most things, but it's still a minor breach. Or there is, shaking your head, inferior performance, where it is a material breach. Okay? So the words basically tell us uh, what is complete performance. That is, if the world operated in utopia and it was everything was just perfect, uh, a party to a contract renders performance exactly to the satisfaction of the other party, exactly as required. If that's the case, then we can just pack up our books and go home because there's nothing more to talk about. Right? Complete performance means it's strict performance and there's been no breach and there's no reason for chapter 16, right? That's a perfect one. Um, tender of performance just means an unconditional and absolute offer by a contracted party performance. So yeah, I mean, it just means that there has been perfect tender of performance, <coughs> which just basically means that both parties did exactly what they were gonna do. Ha uh ha, -huh. real life, that rarely happens. What does happen in real life in contractual obligations is we get pretty close, okay? There is substantial performance. And what is substantial? Uh, well, performance by a contract pro contracting party that deviates, meaning shifts, only slightly from complete performance. So are you happy, fully satisfied, if you don't get 100% but you get 90%? I mean, if you're substantially <coughs> happy, but does the human in you, or does the business in you, easily give up the 10%? Or just, you know, are you that evolved that you just say, oh, I'm sure they did their best, you know, I'm just gonna move on. Or, and, it, and you know, I'm not just putting it on your doorstep as a person, as a business, as a corporation, if you didn't get 100% performance, don't you have a legal duty to your shareholders to seek remedy for that 10%? Of course, because there has been a minor breach. Occurs when a party renders substantial performance of its contractual duties, but not 100%. So a breach is a breach, right? So you may, you know, so, you know, an example might be, you know, we're talking construction, and, you know, the book obviously was written before the, uh, the presidential election, because it gave Donald Trump as an example, and it said, you know, Donald Trump, the real estate developer, uh, negotiates with a contractor to make another big mega structure somewhere, and he negotiates into the contract that he wants three ply windows for a hundred million dollar uh, building, and you know the building is completed, but it's two ply windows. Okay. Now you might you know if the huge you know Trump Plaza type building where there are windows everywhere, once it's done. It's not like you can fix it after the fact very easily, right? You can't, you know, it's too late. I mean, Trump has sold all those uh, apartments to the Chinese. It's too late now uh, to, uh, you know. So what did Mr. Trump get? He got substantial performance. What is he left to deal with? A minor breach. 
And let's say the value of a building with two ply windows is 95 million. The value of the property with three ply window was indeed 100 million. What is Mr. Trump entitled to? And what can you bet? He's going to, I mean, I don't think Donald Trump lies, lies down and just rolls over. What is he going to do? He's going to sue. Uh, for what? For that five million. So you get the idea that a minor breach leaves, um, you know, is not the end of the story, right? I mean, here you go. You can recover damages. A reason party is not going to say, break down the building, take down every window, and make sure you put a three-fly window. I mean, come on, that would just be ridiculous even for you know, passing any judgment, uh, but even for a very strong personality. Okay, so that is a substantial performance minor breach situation, but what if, oh my God, you know, it's not as easy as that. It is inferior uh, performance, where one of the party fails to perform expressly or impliedly on a contractual obligation and impairs or destroys the essence of the contract. I mean, this is a bigger deal. Uh, that is a material breach, which happens when uh, a party actually renders inferior performance of his or her contractual duties. And that leaves the non-breaching party, meaning the party that didn't do anything wrong under the contract. They were willing to pay if they got what they were looking for to do what? To put some more in the driver's seat to either cancel the contract altogether and seek restitution, meaning make me whole, or sue to enforce the contract as is and seek damages. So here, I mean, you know, it depends on what went wrong, right? I mean, the book had an example, like what if the university wanted to, uh, you know, enrollment is up, way up, you can only hope. Uh, and, you know, we decide for September 2016, we need a new dorm, you know. We need a state-of-the-art dorm, and it's got to house a thousand students because that's how many new people we're expecting to live on campus. So you negotiate uh, with a developer, a contractor, and midway through the project, now it's January of 2016, you find that they structurally did not do this well enough such that the new building, there's no way that it can house a thousand students. It would, you know, you'd be lucky if you can get 500 because you just did, I don't know, a whole lot about construction, you didn't put the right beams, you didn't do the right architecture, whatever. Now, you know, that's called being in a pickle, right? What is the university supposed to do, right? Do they go ahead with this building instead of starting from zero and say at least we can accommodate 500 students and maybe we can give vouchers or something else or make sure that we have a system with off-campus housing or something like that? Or do you say, no, 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 we're gonna have to bite the bullet, we're gonna have to tear down, and we're going to have to start a new because we ultimately, for the long term, need this. You know, there's, you know, there's no other sites available. It's not like we can have 500 here and then get more space. You know, real estate is out of control, right? So you have to look to see because this is subs, you know, this is substantial non-performance. This is inferior performance, and you simply have to decide as the as the non-breaching party which avenue you pursue. But there are damages here, major damages, and possibly even cancellation or rescinded of the contract. All right, a bunch of cases, some I'll do and some I'll ask you about. Uh, this was a contract where, you know, before we can say that there's a breach of contract, was there a contract in the first place? And this involved Turner Broadcasting Company, uh, Turner Broadcasting System, which is TBS, right? Owned by uh, none other than Ted Turner. And this was, uh, remind me if I'm wrong, but this was a negotiation, like, you know, Turner Enterprises owns all kinds of things, including sports teams and things like that. And this was a negotiation being done by employees of this corporation with another party. And they got pretty close in dealing with the terms and, you know, and the oral communications or written communications, you know, and they basically shook on it and said, we have a deal. We'll pay for this up pretty soon, right? And this took months and so on and so forth. It's involved millions of dollars. Um, what happened was, you know, Ted Turner has been known to have quite a big personality. So when they went to the board, uh, you know, the offices of the company, uh, and to Ted Turner, they're like, ah, lousy deal. We're not selling. Not doing it. The party on the other side said, what do you mean you're not doing it? We have a, we have a contract. 
Um, and TBS maintained there wasn't a contract in the first place. There wasn't, no, no final understanding was ever confirmed. And the court has to decide, was there an enforceable contract between McDavid and Turner Broadcasting? And remember, employees and agents of a company can bind the company. And the court says absolutely. This went pretty far, um, you know, and basically, essentially, they didn't have proper approval, but that's not, that's not the problem with McDavid, right? You can't change your mind. This went far enough along to have been a contract such that it is an enforceable contract. So that's really what the issue here. It's very fact specific in this case. The other couple of concepts we'll talk about just a few minutes before we take a break is something called anticipatory breach. We know what a breach is, right? It's when one party doesn't do what they're supposed to do in the contract. What is anticipatory? Well, what does the word anticipation mean? To wait. to wait, right? So an anticipatory breach is, you know, an, an anticipation of the formal breach. And this is what the contract says that performance is due on October 31st. But it is clear today on October, whatever it is today, 24th, um, that the other party's not going to do it. Either they're unwilling, unable, whatever the case might be, party indicates that he or she will not be able to perform on the contract. So here the law says law. We want order. We, you know, if this is an anticipatory breach, in this case, the non-breaching party is immediately discharged and may sue immediately. And in fact, or sue is kind of too hard a word, may take action to treat <coughs> this contract as being breached and take proper steps to protect themselves. And we'll see there's another concept, I don't uh, know if it comes up right away, of mitigation of damages. You know, just because someone breached a contract with you doesn't mean that you say, all right, well, you know, it wasn't until the 31st that we had negotiated, I'm just gonna sit here and do nothing for seven days. You know, I could have gone out, I could have negotiated with someone else, I could have tried to mitigate, but I don't. You know, the law is gonna say that's, you know, that's gonna be a problem for me as a non-breaching party because I didn't take anticipatory breach seriously, right? Anticipatory breach means that if you know that there's been a breach already ahead of time, do something about it ahead of time. Okay, what do you get when there is a breach? You get typically damages. And, you know, damages are, in a breach of contract case for the most part, money. You know, I know money cannot fix everything, but it goes a pretty long way uh, in terms of making, uh, you know, it can't create the situation that you wanted to happen under the contract, but it'll go a long way to making someone whole. So monetary damages are an award of money available to the non-breaching party when, remember, even if it's a minor breach or a major breach or a substantial breach or a material breach, you're entitled to monetary. And you know, we'll come back to the different types of damages, compensatory, consequential, liquidated, nominal. It's not as hard as it sounds. It's pretty intuitive in many ways. But that is where we will pick up after the break and after the attendance today. So let's come back by 10.30. I'll do quick attendance. And uh, we will start again exactly at 10.30. By the way, I'm getting questions about the exam, and of course, everyone wants to see the exam, and I think you should. I think you should absolutely look at the exam, look at the questions you got wrong, take a look, try to see why you got it wrong, um, because that's how the final is going to be. So don't, you know, we'll try to wrap up as quickly as we can today, so you have the time uh, to do that. Um, but take that opportunity, because to me, that's the best way to prepare uh, for the next exam. But honestly, I think, you know, the mean and the, Average is a, you know, maybe a point or two lower than I'm usually used to seeing it, uh, but kind of where I expect it to be, but I do hope it to be a lot higher for the final exam, and it almost always is higher for just about every exam. So do not be discouraged if your individual performance did not live up to whatever your expectations might have been. So we'll have time for that. But let's get back to contracts, because you know, what do we want to talk about on a Saturday morning if not money damages, right? So. Um, so we left off with all of these different terms, right? I mean, you know, you go, if someone breaches a contract with you, you go to court, um, and you're looking for money to make you whole. And unfortunately, unfortunately, there are different ways to describe the money that you're getting. And 
And, and again, as I said, don't be afraid. Let's look at what each of these terms mean. When someone breaches a contract and the other party is looking for monetary damages, the number one measure of monetary damages is this one. It's compensatory damages. And look at the word compensatory. Compensation. To compensate someone for something that went wrong. That makes sense, right? I mean, none of us can put the world into the way it should exactly be, but at least the legal system provides us a way to get as close as possible. So what are compensatory damages? An award of money intended to compensate a non-breaching party for what? For the loss of the bargain. That's a fancy way of saying is, I negotiated and I bargained for this, I didn't get that, and that is the loss of the bargain. And money is hopefully going to make me whole, right? And that's the purpose, to place the non-breaching party in the position, or I would say, as close to the position uh, that they would have been had the contract been fully and completely performed. And it's also referred to as restoring the benefit of the bargain. It's like 15 different ways of kind of saying uh, the same thing. Let me just see what the next slide says and then I want to give some examples. Yeah. So can I look up in a book what the measure of compensatory damages will be in a particular situation? Is that even possible? Think about it. Every contract is unique, right? Every contract is a private agreement. So, you know, the measure of compensa compensatory damages is unique to that contract and to the breach. So, award of the amount really depends on, well, what kind of contract was it? You know, and if you see examples for sale of goods, construction contracts, employment contracts, who was the party uh, that breached the contract. So these are the kinds of factors. Uh, and I'll give you a couple of, yeah, I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, sale of goods, right? Uh, one party is selling something to another party. What do you think they're getting back in return? Money, right? I will sell you these goods for your business, deliverable on November 1st uh, at the price of uh, $10, per unit. And I'm going to make it simple, I'm buying 100 units, right? So what's the contract price? $1,000, right? I hope I got the math wrong. The math right, 100 times 10 equals 1,000. I will pay you $1,000 on November 1st and I will get these units. Now, what do I need these units for? Well, I'm going to use them to sell things at my retail stores and blah, 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 right? I'm going to jack up the price and, and, and sell things. Okay. Let's say delivery comes late. And instead of November 1st, I actually am um, told that they can't deliver on November 1st. Um, I might have to wait four or five days. Well, that's just not going to fly. You know, I'm a small business. I need this product on November 1st. And let's say they told me, they were nice about it, they told me two days in advance. Right? That's an anticipatory breach. I knew two days in advance. What should I be doing? I'm frantically calling up any other place where I can get this. Right? And I find someone who's willing to sell me. 100 units. The only problem is that it's $15. Right? I, I can't get it for $10. I mean, you know you know how timing is, right? I mean, when you're desperate, you're going to pay more. Well, what am I going to do? I have to. I go ahead, I get delivery on November 1st, but what happens? Instead of paying $1,000, 100 times 10, I now wind up paying 100 times 15. Thank God I picked easy example. It was $1,500. Um, what kind of breach was this? It was definitely a breach. It's kind of bordering on, you know, being a substantial breach because I didn't get what I needed to get on November 1st from party A. So, okay, I did what I needed to do, but here's the thing. I'm going to sue. I'm going to sue the first party. What are the damages that I'm looking for? What are the compensatory damages? Exactly. It, you know, and you go back to the definition of what are compensatory damages designed to do to put me in the position I would have been. And look, I mean, you know, yes, now I have to drop everything, I have to find people, um, 
to sell it to me and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I went through some hassle. And it may be that the court might tack on some damages, but they're typically not. Um, you know, typically I'm going to get $500. And that's it. And that's it. Because then I can give you, you know, examples like that for construction uh, contracts where, you know, you wind up paying more or you didn't get as much as you wanted. Employment contracts. Like, you know, particularly with an employment contract, first of all, employment contracts are unique. Most of us do not have an employment contract. Most of us will go work, and we will work as employees at will. Meaning, as long as our employer likes us, we have a job. As long as we want to perform that job, we come. Otherwise, we give our two-week notice. But there are certain types of jobs where you do get an employment contract, meaning you sign on with a company for a period of time, and you guaranteed your salary for a period of time because they really want you because you have a certain kind of skill. You know, I gave you the sports example, right? I mean, you don't want to lose that good player. You sign them on for a particular period of time. Those are employment contracts, right? Um, so if someone was hired uh, for a period of two years by a company, the company after a year decides they can get some better talent in the marketplace. It's not like that individual has done anything wrong. They didn't breach the contract. They're still performing services, but they're just not, you know, enjoying that working relationship. They rather have someone else. They would, be, all right. They fire that that individual after a year instead of two years. And let's just make it simple. And let's say the individual is guaranteed hundred thousand dollars a year in salary. They got paid hundred thousand dollars, but they didn't get hundred thousand dollars in year two. What is the measure of compensa uh, compensatory damages? The difference between 200 minus 100. So you start to see how compensatory damages are calculated by a court, by an arbitrator, by anyone. You know, in most cases, you get it. You get what what it should be. Uh, but in certain situations, compensatory damages, according to the non-breaching party, is not enough. There are other damages, what I call domino damages. You know, by one side not doing what they were supposed to do. Yeah, I wound up paying more or X, Y, and Z, but I also suffered what, are, what, are, what the law refers to as consequential damages. And again, look at the words, consequential, consequence of something going wrong. I mean, that's sort of where this terminology comes from. Consequential damages, according to the legal definition, are foreseeable, something that you can foresee or expect ahead of time that arise from circumstances outside the contract. Right? I was expecting to get a delivery of this. I didn't get it, even though I might be able to get the same thing on the open market um, for more money. It's bringing with it more damages that were foreseeable. right? For example, I got the $15, but you know what happened? I had to. Uh, suspend operations for a day or two. It took that long. Maybe I didn't get it on November 1st. I actually got it on November 2nd. You know, you might say, what's the big deal? It's a day. Well, in the life of a business, if your employees don't do anything for a day, if you keep the lights on and pay salary, you're out. Money, right? So yeah, I wound up paying $5 more per widget, but I also didn't make any, didn't get any revenue for that day. I might have paid shipping charges. I might have, you know, all of these other things that, what I, you know, again, call the domino damages. You know, like the dominoes is one thing goes wrong, and you know, you start to see other things sort of follow. So you might, you know, when you write a complaint for, or in a lawsuit or otherwise, serve a complaint for, what, you know, what, what, what did the party do wrong? What are the measure of damages? You might just ask not just for compensatory damages, you will prove what your consequential damages were. As a result of the breach by party, party B sustained damages in the form of lost revenue, uh, uh, wages uh, paid on days where no work was being put, blah, 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 then you will put a number on that. And courts will entertain consequential damages in addition to compensatory damages where they were foreseeable. And you might say, well, what's, yeah, it's conceivable that if you don't make delivery to a business on time, that that, that would happen. Courts would be willing to do it. Now, parties like to limit their liability. 
So if I'm the seller and I'm selling things for $10 a widget and I know that at times I miss my delivery date, things that may be out of my control because my workers don't show up or because I couldn't get the product or whatever, I might be late, I'm willing to pay the compensatory damages, but I'm afraid that these consequential damages could like, break my bank, right? So you might find parties that will negotiate into a contract that I will disclaim, that I will, you know, if there is a breach, the breaching party will be liable for only compensatory damages and not consequential damages. Contracts are private agreements. Sophisticated parties negotiate these types of things because they understand how contracts work. And one example of where you will see a disclaimer for consequential damages are sales contracts or lease, lease agreements. So the book had an interesting kind of an example. Um, a PhD student, right? We're here at Rutgers, a lot of PhD students, right? A PhD student buys software from some software company uh, for their computer. It's $100. And they, um, you know, load up the software on their computer. It's faulty, it's got a bug, and sadly, it destroys their hard drive. On the hard drive was this poor PhD student's dissertation never back. The only place it was was on the hard drive of their computer. And and it's clear that buying the software, I mean, you know, look, technology goes wrong sometimes. This one CD-ROM somehow was corrupted and it just wiped out the hard drive. So what are the compensatory damages? I didn't get a good CD-ROM, it was $100, that's $100. They'll give you a new CD, that's not a big deal. But consequential damages, years worth of work, starting over, uh, tuition, you know, you could see that that's a bad domino effect, right? So a lot of licensing companies and software companies will disclaim all consequential damages by the way. And you might say, well, is that ethical? Is that right? How dare they? Well, they're going to say, look, we didn't do this intentionally. It is possible that in our factory in Michigan, you know, thousands of CDs are coming out and one of them got corrupted through no fault of our own, through, regardless of our quality control and so on, and we're not going to go bankrupt over that, you know, and by the way, we will tell you of the disclaimer, and you might say, well, when did I know about it? You knew about it when you look at the fine print on any piece of software that you buy, that most of these things have disclaimed liability for these types of actions. So you get a flavor for how the real world uses contract law uh, to basically you know, enhance their legal position. So really, really important for business people to understand this terminology and how it works. Nominal damages are no big deal. Nominal damages, what does the word nominal mean? Small. So nominal damages are damages that could be awarded to the non-breaching party, but the non-breaching party sues the breaching party, even though you really didn't have much of a financial law. So, if you remember the, the, the person that had the employment contract for two years and got fired after one year? Well, guess what? Company A didn't want them. Uh, company B was happy to pluck them away. And basically, they lost a $100,000 job. They were plucked by company B that was willing to pay them that salary and hire them the next day. Did they suffer any compensatory damages? In this example that I gave? No. Did they suffer any consequential damages? Maybe their ego got hurt a little bit, but no. I mean, that's not really going to be, you know, I'm going to call them the that person is angry. They're just angry. How dare someone, um, you know, not want me? And how dare they, you know, and you wind up suing anyway, because technically it wasn't a breach. Yeah, this was a for one dollar. Because courts do not like these kinds of lawsuits. Yeah, technically it's a breach, uh, but cases involving nominal damages are usually brought on principle. And courts don't like them. Why do you think courts don't like them? Why do you think they're ready to dismiss them? It is a waste of the court's time. Yes, we live in a litigious society, and if we're going to decide things based on principle, you know, just because someone can say, yes, I got a judgment, I got zero, no, dollar of damages, that's not what the court's time should be. You know, it's a frivolous lawsuit in many ways. Uh, but if you have nominal damages along with something else, you know, you're seeking an injunction or something like that, that's different. But if you're just going to court, 
where you suffered nothing else, uh, courts will not uh, favor that kind of a lawsuit. The other thing that um, parties are expected to do under our legal system is something called mitigation of damages. And the word mitigate, to mitigate something, means to make it less, right? Mitigation of damages is low. There are two parties in a contract. Even if there is a breaching party and a non-breaching party, the non-breaching party has clean hands, they didn't do anything wrong. Once a breach happens to them, they have a duty under our legal system to not just sit there and say, I'll just sit, you know, let the damages accumulate. Uh, it's not how the legal system works. The legal system puts an affirmative duty on the non-breaching party to reduce their own damages to the extent that they can. That a, and what's the extent that they can? What a reasonable person would do under those circumstances. What a reasonable company would do under those circumstances, right? So the extent of the mitigation depends on the type of the contract. So for example, if an employer breaches an employment contract, remember our person who was fired after a year one says, you know what, I've been meaning to travel and I'm not even gonna look for a new job. I'm just gonna say I have a two year contract, someone canceled that contract in year one, I'm just gonna go to court, sue for $100,000 and sit back and enjoy it uh, next year. Not so fast, have a duty to mitigate damages try to find substitute employment. And, you know, it's not like, all right, you know, you're gonna get another, you know, another job paying, you know, 10% of your original salary, no. You know, you, you are only under an obligation to take comparable employment, meaning something that comes close to what you were denied, but you can't just sit there and say, I didn't do anything wrong, so I'm gonna maximize my damages. No, there is an affirmative obligation on the non-breaching party to reduce or avoid further damages. All right, everyone clear on that? Did we talk about liquidated damages already? We might have in other contexts, and if we haven't, then maybe it's just my faulty memory. What are liquidated damages? Here's a word that, you know how I sometimes say, well, look at the word and you can kind of understand the meaning? You can't, you can't. Liquid, liquidated, I, I don't know how that leads you to what it actually means. Liquidated damages are damages that the parties agree in advance that certain damages will be available if the contract is breached. So, remember how I said that the law favors parties to reach their own agreement so they're not taking up the court's precious time, and it's actually in the best interest of the parties also. So, some sophisticated parties will just negotiate. If Remember, I needed my delivery by November 1st, um, and I knew that there would be all kinds of things that would happen. I would have my staff sitting there. I knew I'd have to go out in the open market and blah, blah, blah. What if I negotiated with the other party and said, if, you know, we all go into things with our best of intentions, but we all know things can go wrong. You know, we negotiate and we say, look, if you don't deliver on that day, uh, there will be a penalty. And the penalty will be, pick a reasonable number. You know, for each day that you are late, there will be, uh, you know, damages payable in the amount of 10% of the contract price or something like that, okay? Liquidated damages are fine where it would be difficult or not just difficult, impractical. I don't know. I don't know what the domino effect will be. I, you know, I don't know if I'm going to get it for $12. I don't know if I'm going to get it for $15. I don't even know if I'm going to get it for $8. Maybe the price will come down. I don't know. Uh, I'm gonna have to negotiate something now so that I can be prepared, okay? So, as long as you are reasonable in the circumstances, courts do not like liquidated damages that go above and beyond, right? What if I said, for every day that you're late, you owe me $300,000? I mean, that's, that's I mean, not enough. They have to have some relevance, some concept of reality of actual damages. They're not exact. But if that's the case, courts will say, more power to you, negotiate your own liquidated damages, and then you will not be up the courts. So everyone understand compensatory, consequential, nominal, and liquidated. Let me think about this case. I have completely forgot what this case was about. This was 
a hotel group with the liquidated, can anyone help me out here? Otherwise I'm gonna have to look up the case, thank you. Oh, yes, 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 thank you, okay. They were, um, uh, they defined a story hotel for yeah. yeah. However, after living hotel. And they got paid like, I don't know, like $80,000 or something like that for architectural services. That's right. But um, when the building inspections, the, the, there were flaws in the design. So the building is up. Right. And then it demolished it. Yeah, it was that big a flaw that, um, building down. Ouch. But did the, par the parties negotiate a liquidated damages clause? This is the architectural firm and the company. They were only awarded 70,000. So the question was, the parties saying, this is, this is crazy. You know, yes, it was in the contract with the architectural firm that if something were to go wrong, you are only entitled to the purchase price, the contract price, and nothing else. Like, but, but who could have expected that based on their design, we construct a building? You know, can you imagine if you paid eighty thousand dollars to an architectural firm, what the actual cost of construction must have been, right? You know, maybe it's a million dollar building. What was it? Four point two. To demolish a four point two building and start from scratch means you're out four million dollars. It doesn't help me that I get my seventy thousand dollars back from the architectural firm. I want to take you know. And what does the court say? They're only liable. The court said, no. the court said, no. you know, we had a liquidated damages clause. You knew what could potentially be. Uh, and here, what the court really said was, you sophisticated parties. Your contract, you know, your business parties, the firm is the business party. You company, look, any company that makes a $4.2 million building is not penniless, is not unsophisticated. So the court could have come in and maybe and you know, fairness and equity principles, they said, we don't need to. You don't need to do that here because the part, you know, you know, just because you made a bad deal or someone else could have negotiated or so on a little bit differently, you know, we're gonna leave contract understandings if they are not so egregious and so unfair and all of that, we're gonna leave the parties. So good day for the architectural firm, not such a good day for the other company. The liquidated damages clause was enforceable. All right, wrapping up here, uh, there's a lot in this chapter about, well, what else? You know, what else can you do when one of the parties uh, breaches a contract? Well, one thing you can obviously do is get out of the contract, right? You know, and we talked about it. Rescission, excuse me, is undoing a contract. So, for example, if the breach is where, um, you know, one of the parties used fraud, duress, undoing, you know, all of that other thought. Yeah, you may be looking for damages, but at the same time, you want to also, to the extent that the contract is still ongoing, you want the court to get you out of that contract. So, yeah, rescission or cancellation is also something that you could be asking uh, the court to do. Uh, the other thing is, what if one party has given up something uh, as well? So, you know, in a contract where I, um, I'm suing somebody because they didn't pay me, right, uh, on time. Uh, and I'm suing them for the purchase price, but the problem is that I've already done some work or I've already delivered some goods. I could be asking for restitution. So, right, I, you know, I had to make, you know, this time I'm the seller, not the buyer, right? I've already delivered those widgets on November 1st. I didn't get paid. I'm waiting, <laughs> you know? I don't do business for free. Uh, and now there's another delivery due. Well, okay, fine. I'm not going to make that delivery until I get paid. But here's the problem. I, I need to get my goods back, right? Restitution. So again, I'm going to court, not just for monetary damages, meaning pay me, or pay me for the time as a hassle or whatever. I also want the goods that I deliver uh, to be returned to me. So again, you know, on breach of contract, you could be asking the court to cancel a contract, to make restitution, um, uh, you know, obviously have to go, go to court to do these things. The next slide I will just mention right now, but I will tell you that rid of attachment and rid of garnishment is something that we cover when we cover the UCC in business launch. But it is something that, for those of you that may go on and not take business launch, I don't know why you would do that when you could be 
engaged in like such an incredible um, course. But for those of you that decide not to take business law too, I just want to explain what these are. You know, there's a misconception among you know business people that once you go to court and you get a judgment, that's it. You're home free. Uh, you know, the court said I am entitled to damages in the amount of X. That's it, right? That should be over, shouldn't it? Um, no. In real, in the real world, you could, you know, what is a judgment? A judgment is a piece of paper signed by the court that says party A wins, party B loses, party A must pay party B fifty thousand dollars in damages. It's a piece of paper. You have to collect them. Do you think, do you like to write our checks? Do you like to pay? No, we resist doing things until we really, really have to. So just because someone lost a lawsuit doesn't mean that they are standing at the court's uh, uh, footsteps ready to write you out a check. You have to collect. And sometimes you have to go back to court because the party is not willing to pay you. You know, now you can't, you know, again, you can't do anything illegal. You can't say, let me go hire some thugs and, you know, struggle. You can't do that, you have to use legal means. So these are the legal means. You may have to go back to court, and I know this is not the best part of our legal system, but the party who wins now has to incur more legal fees to get more legal action to get paid for something that the court already said they should have gotten paid for, right? And those are things like writs of attachment. Writ of attachment is basically go back to the court and have the court basically intervene to have law enforcement go and seize the property of the individual that's refusing to pay you. Or maybe garnish uh, their assets uh, to pay you, right? So we talk about, when we talk about creditor debtors and so on, is when we talk about these things a lot more in that context. But the point here is that you, future business people, should understand that, you know, as much as I say to you, it's so expensive and so time consuming, isn't it better to just reach negotiation with someone and resolve a dispute that way? Even if you go to court and get a judgment, it's not that easy to pay you. You still might have to take legal action simply to get paid. So, take that. All right. The, this slide is about where money is just not enough, or money uh, uh, in terms of a breach um, is either not enough or inadequate. But you're looking for something else with respect to a breach of contract. So, this are, remember what equity is. Equitable remedies is something other than money. Yes. Yeah. To prevent the sure. Case, right? Yeah. So if you bring another party who doesn't want to pay you to the court again, so you incur another cost, right? Are you going to sue them again for you know, those costs? Or yeah. So, yeah. So the question is, um, you won. You got a judgment. Now you have to hire another lawyer or go back to your law firm and have them file another action for a writ of garnishment or writ of attachment. Are you going to be able to recover those costs, the legal fees? The general rule in our legal system, like it or not, is parties incur their own fees. And the only exception to that rule is that under certain statutes, it is possible to recover attorney's fees, your reasonable attorney's fees, but those are specific. I mean, breach of contract is not one of them. So unless this is bad faith or something like that, a lot of parties will claim that. And some courts may grant it on that basis, but the general rule in our legal system is each party incurs in the legal system. So this is not like anybody who won, who won. Who, who won has to pay the other party's legal fees? No. The other one. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, and it's a worthwhile point to, uh, to sort of bring out. Uh, which is to say that only in certain kinds of lawsuits can you get the losing party to pay your legal fees. But in most lawsuits, you don't get your legal fees back. You, you know, so cost of litigation, that's why I sometimes say that if you're suing for $50,000, but you're going to incur $60,000 in legal fees and lost time, do the math. It may not be worth it. And that's not fair. And that's and that's all the more reason where contracts should be better drafted to anticipate and deal with these issues. Because going to court is not, is not, it doesn't make economic sense unless you're talking about millions of dollars. But it's an excellent question. 
All right, so we're back to what are the types of equitable remedies, meaning things that are different than money. And we'll talk about the specific performance, reformation, and injunction. All right, I hope that this is on the slide, yes. Uh, what is specific performance? Specific performance. I think that kind of defines it. Specific, meaning something specific. Performance that is specific. A remedy that orders the breaching party to perform the acts promised in the contract. So, I don't want money. I want what I was supposed to get under the contract. Now, that might not be something that is even possible in a lot. You know, I, I might sit there and have a temper tantrum that I must, I must, I must have my delivery on November 1st, and you must, because that, you know, that's not realistic. It's just not going to happen. But there are certain types of contracts where specific performance is possible. What if it's the sale of something that is so unique um, that, you know, the, the book had a good case about it where it's a piece of property, where a couple entered into a contract with another couple to buy a piece of property in upstate New York, and at the last minute, the facts of the case weren't, I know the facts of that case. It actually involved um, the seller where well, I think the wife had multiple sclerosis. So it was a sad situation. You know, they were selling based on medical needs and then, you know, ultimately they didn't need to do it financially and they went to the other side and they said, could you please back out? Because it's just such an emotion, you know, we have such an emotional uh, uh, attachment to this piece of property um, that we really don't want to go through. And, you know, again, put emotions aside for a moment and look at it just from a legal perspective. The other side said, no, we want this property. They went to court and they asked the court to force the sale. And the court agreed with the buyers and said, you know, every house is unique. And uh, although there are some, you know, some touchy-feely kind of circumstances, but it is, you know, justice is supposed to be blind. Uh, we're going to order the sale of the property based on the specific performance and not for you know, I mean, the other party could have just asked for damages. They could have said, well, you know, what if we buy another property that's similar and you have to pay us, you know, the difference and all of that. They don't want that. They wanted that house in that part of Boston, New York, and they got it. So, you know, we're shaking our heads what a mean thing to do. But it is, thank God we have the case because now we can demonstrate what specific performance is all about, right? That's specific performance. What else? Reformation, not a big deal. An equitable doctrine that permits a court to rewrite a contract to express the party's true intentions. Remember when we talked about mistakes? And we talked about how, you know, $10,000 could actually have been $100,000, but it was a typing error, and at the last minute, you know, was it ever, yeah, that's called reformation, where a court would in equity say, wait, that's not right. And what's an injunction? We talked a lot about injunctions. Injunctions is basically a court order that legally forces someone to do something or not do something, all right? You know, we talked about injunctions a lot when we were talking about intellectual property, right? If someone steals my patent, yeah, I'm looking for damages, but more and more importantly, I want them to stop it, right? That's an injunction. That's not monetary damages, but that can also be ordered uh, with respect to uh, a breach of contract where it is appropriate. Um, was this a case that I've already done? Yeah. Shame on me. I thought it was a text box. Um, so it was an actual case. All right. I get my editions of the textbook mixed up. So they actually made it a case. All right. Well, that's good. We're done. That was this case. This is a case where, you know, we have an ill spouse and the court absolutely said that the property has to be sold to the buyer. Excuse me. Arbitration. We've talked about arbitration as a um, uh, way to avoid the court system. Right? Arbitrator is someone who, you know, and by the way, arbitration is a relatively formal process um, where a neutral third party decides a dispute as opposed to a judge and a jury, right? Um, and courts have said that arbitration agreements, including binding arbitration, meaning the arbitration's decision is final and no appeal, are valid, enforceable contract provisions, and that really was what was at issue in this case. Someone bought a fancy schmancy Mercedes from a car dealership. They weren't happy. Um, they wanted to take the dealership to court, but in the sales agreement, there was binding arbitration. And the court said, too bad. 
you know what you're signing. And it's not like binding arbitration is giving away your legal rights. Arbitration is a very sophisticated process. It is a speedy, less expensive way to resolve a dispute. No, you're not going to get your day in court. You agree to arbitration, you have to submit to arbitration. And a couple of other minor things, you know, we talked about torts already, right? Torts are private wrongs, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, uh, courts will sometimes, you know, have a lawsuit brought by a party that is arguing that look, I have a party, you know, party A and party B have a contract. But a third party is trying to get one of the parties to breach that contract. Um, and that is a tort of intentional interference with contractual relations. You know, you have a valid enforceable contract, third party knows that, and they're trying to get somebody to breach that contract. What if I want to, you know, what if it's a supplier and I want to get those goods and try to get them to breach that contract with you, I will pay you more, uh, I will make you whole. The court said that's not fair. You can't have third parties illegally interfere with other rights. These are not the kind of cases that get brought a lot, but it's sort of thrown in this chapter to kind of say that it is impossible. And basically, there's not a whole lot on this slide, the court will basically say, look, every party is supposed to deal with uh, other parties in a good faith, fair dealing kind of a way. We know this already. That's implied in every contract that parties will deal with one another in honest, honorable kind of a way. Have I forgotten one more case? Uh, Fortis Insurance. Oh, I remember this case. This is a sad case. Does anyone remember? This is the health insurance case, right? Anyone want to tell me a little bit about this case before we move on real quickly? It's the kind of thing that almost cannot happen anymore under the new healthcare reform law. This is 2009, and this was something that insurance companies were sadly doing. You know, someone buys an insurance policy. I don't mean the kind of policy that you get from your employer, where someone goes to an insurance company and buys an individual insurance policy to cover them, and on that insurance, this was the facts of the case, on that policy there was a question that said, have you ever been diagnosed with a autoimmune disorder or something? So, no, and they just check off no. And based on their health history and blah, 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 the company issues for the policy uh, to cover their medical expenses and pay premiums, blah, blah, blah. And then this person, I think, goes to give blood or something like that and has blood work done the following year and sadly finds out that they're HIV positive. All right? And the doctor writes a note and accidentally puts the wrong date. Things happen, right? You'd say, ah, it can never happen. It happened. Where, let's just say they bought the policy in 2009, and the actual diagnosis came in 2010, and the doctor just writes, the patient diagnosed May 2009. It goes in the medical file. And then later on, as you can imagine, when you're diagnosed as HIV positive, you're going to incur a lot of medical expenses and a lot of costly drugs and so on and so forth. The insurance company actually gets this paperwork about the doctor's note. They look at it and they actually, you know, they have sort of adjusters and so on, and they think that the person lied on their uh, insurance application because based on the date that the doctor put, it looked like the insurance application came after. Um, and they cancel the policy. So here's an individual that now has no more health insurance and uh, has all of these bills, and they actually try to negotiate with the company Give me a chance. No, I didn't know. Uh, you know, you can't cancel my policy. Let me do an insurance company. This is nothing we can do. Shuts them down completely. Um, and the person sues. They hire a good lawyer, and they get this. You know, the little guy wins. Get a ten million dollar settlement. And the insurance company goes to court and says, "That's ridiculous. You know, we're willing to pay the compensatory damages, the, the cost of the medical treatment." doesn't rise to $10 million, why are we getting slapped with such a big lawsuit? Well, here's the thing. You know, the measure of, you know, when we went into the damages, I gave you compensatory, I gave you consequential, I didn't give you punitive, did I? Right? Because punitive damages are not something that are typically given for breach of contract. But they are for bad faith, right? And here, the court basically said, this is bad faith. 
you know, what is the job of an insurance company to at least be reasonable? They didn't even give this person a chance to explain when they could have actually sorted this out, even if the law legally allowed them. And they can't, by the way, no insurance company can do this today. Uh, but in 2009, they might have been able to if the person honestly lied on their application. But the fact of the matter here was they didn't lie. It was a clerical mistake that they could have proven after the fact. They never even were given the opportunity. The court said this is a perfect case for punitive damages and the $10 million or $50 million award. So, so it was kind of a nice case to kind of bring, bring on the point that even in breach of contract cases, it is possible to get punitive damages if you have 